This is Booked on Rock. I'm Eric Senich. Our guest is Philip Norman, author of Wild Thing, the short spellbinding life of Jimi Hendrix. Over 50 years after his death, Jimi Hendrix is celebrated as the greatest rock guitarist of all time. But before he was setting guitars in the world of flame, James Marshall Hendrix was a shy kid in Seattle, plucking at a broken ukulele and in fear of a father who would hit him for playing left-handed. Bringing Jimmy's story to vivid life against the backdrop of mid-century rock and with a wealth of new information, acclaimed music biographer Philip Norman delivers a captivating and definitive portrait of a musical legend. Drawing from unprecedented access to Jimmy's brother, Leon Hendricks, who provides disturbing details about their childhood, as well as Kathy Etchingham and Linda Keith, the two women who played vital roles in Jimmy's rise to stardom. Norman traces Jimmy's life from playing in clubs on the segregated Chitlin circuit where he encountered daily racism to barely surviving in New York's Greenwich Village, where he was taken up by the Animals bass player Chaz Chandler in 1966 and exported to swinging London and international stardom. For four staggering years, from 1966 to 1970, Jimmy totally rewrote the rules of rock stardom, notably at Monterey and Woodstock where he played his protest-infused rendition of the Star-Spangled Banner, while becoming the highest-paid musician of his day. But it all abruptly ended in the shabby basement of a London hotel with Jimmy's too early death. With remarkable detail, Wild Thing finally reveals the truth behind this long-shrouded tragedy. Norman's exhaustive research reveals a young man who was as shy and polite in private as he was outrageous in public, whose insecurity about his singing voice could never be allayed by his instrumental genius and whose unavailing efforts to please his father left him searching for the family he felt he never truly had. Filled with insights into the greatest moments in rock history, Wild Thing is a mesmerizing account of music's most enduring and endearing figures. Philip Norman is the best-selling biographer of Eric Clapton, Buddy Holly, The Rolling Stones, John Lennon, Elton John, Mick Jagger, Paul McCartney, and now Jimi Hendrix. A novelist and playwright, he lives in London. To hear a playlist of Jimi Hendrix, including the music discussed in this episode, just head over to the show notes page. Philip, thank you so much for being on the podcast. My pleasure. As you point out in your book, each year Jimi Hendrix sells more albums than in any while he was alive, yet Jimi's time here was so short. You've seen and written about many legendary artists over the years, going back to your days with the Sunday Times in the mid to late 60s, James Brown, Little Richard, The Beach Boys, Fleetwood Mac, The Beatles... What is it about Jimi Hendrix that continues to connect with so many people to this day? Well, firstly, it is the artistry. Uh, it is the guitar playing. Um, he just got sounds out of a guitar um, that even the greatest uh, uh, rock guitarists, because he was a rock musician, really, although he could play everything, that had never been heard before. And they are still thrilling. They do not date. Like the greatest pop and rock music doesn't date. Um, but also his personality still affects people. People still feel sad to think that this shining talent really was on the earth for such a very short time. And uh, if they look into the story of uh, his last days and his death, it, it seemed that his, his death was a tragic accident that, that could have been very much avoided. We are coming up on what would be Jimmy's 79th birthday, November 27th, 1942, he was born. Can you talk about Jimmy's childhood days? His childhood days were, were dreadful. He um, was born and grew up in Seattle, which is another place associated with the, the genesis of great blues musicians at all. And in fact, the terrible oppression, um, uh, racial oppression of those days was, was somewhat less in Seattle. But his father uh, was a um, hardworking but a very rough, um, unimaginative man. And his mother died at a very, when he was very young, when he was 14. This is something that happened to Paul McCartney as well and tends to sort of figure in the lives of the great rock figures of that time. John Lennon, at roughly the same age, lost his mother. And Jimmy, there was a terrible void in Jimmy's life, really, which, uh, like many other people, um, he, he could only fill by communicating with an audience and with the approval and the, the love of an audience. But it didn't look as though he was going to get very far. He, he was very bright, uh, but, um, but his father didn't sort of bother with his schooling very much. He had a young brother, a younger brother, uh, Leon, 
who uh, Jimmy rather protected, became, you know, to protect his big brother. But then um, his brother, his father, by, after his mother's death, by somehow, he, he, had, he had four half-siblings as well, all of whom had terrible um, birth defects um, that his mother had, had, had born uh, with and without his father. And they were very, very poor. And he, Jimmy, grew up really on the street to a large degree and was fed by people in the, the central district of Seattle, which was a very much a polyglot area of black families, but also Jewish, Chinese, Japanese. And he really was sort of in the care of the community a lot of the time. And he was just a little too old to be taken into care by the local authority. But his brother Liam was always being sort of collared and taken away to be institutionalized and then escape and come back. So it wasn't really, a, you know, there wasn't a great future for him there, but um, he did discover uh, a guitar, uh, initially a little pathetic little cheap guitar, and just that was when his life really began. You do write a lot about his relationship with his father, including the fact that Jimmy finds out he's left-handed early on, and in those days, it's so inconceivable nowadays to think that this would be a problem, but it was so much so that Jimmy's father would hit him if he caught his son using his left hand, he he did, and I mean in uh, in that, I mean that was a you know there was a superstition that it was sort the mark of the devil, um, but even you know in uh, in Britain at that time, Paul McCartney uh, was also left-handed, and uh, you know children who were left-handed were usually sort of told not to write left-handed. Uh, McCartney persevered and did, but a lot of other children you know were told it was wrong and had to stop. And Jimmy's soft-spoken nature, you quote him in the book as saying that that came from his dad. He said, quote, He taught me that I must respect my elders always. I couldn't speak unless I was spoken to first by grown-ups, so I've always been quiet, but I saw a lot of things. A fish wouldn't get in trouble if he kept his mouth shut. You write that a great Mm -hmm. deal can be read between the lines. What do you make of a quote like that? Well, there was a lot of physical, uh, what we now call physical abuse and uh, um, it was much more common in, in quite ordinary homes in those days, you know, for children to be beaten and uh, abused in that way. And J- Jimmy would protect his, he would try to protect his brother. His father was very prone to drink. And when his mother was alive, his mother was sort of itinerant, really came and went. Uh, she was an alcoholic. Then she died. Um, and was sort of, he, he last saw her in a hospital, sitting in a wheelchair, looking like an angel, strange with light coming through her. But his mother, his father, really made no attempt to, you know, be a loving parent. His father worked very hard, but um, wasn't wasn't an affectionate parent and didn't recognize any talent in Jimmy at all. Did his father ever tell Jimmy he was proud of him? I think it might have at the very end because Jimmy did come back to Seattle and bought his family, and particularly his father, a lot of luxuries although uh, when um, jimmy bought his father a, a, bought him a house the, uh, the father complained because the pickup wouldn't fit into the garage so jimmy bought him another house where the garage was big enough for the pickup truck and there were some battles with jimmy's parents over what his name would be was it johnny allen was it james marshall if it were up to jimmy it would be buster right i know well buster was a kind of nickname for uh, you know kids then um and uh, he, he liked buster crab as well who played uh, was the, i think one of the first not the very first but one of the first people to play tarzan in the movies um so that, that was quite, quite common yes but his father had sort of rebaptized him johnny allen and then later on he because his name was jimmy with a j-i-double-m-y and that became jimmy later on hendrix that spelling of that changed as well so yes he was I mean, he was cha- or he, his name was an improvisation rather like one of his guitar solos. His innate passion and ability to play music is fascinating. His brother Leon talked about how it was always inside of him. He relayed something Jimmy told to his grandmother once about hearing sounds in his head. Yes, yes, he did. I mean, he, he was a natural, uh, you know, an instinctive musician, um, but really had to teach himself. He never really got taught it. Uh, just, he picked it up, he, but he picked it up funny enough listening to... I mean, there were obviously the R&B stations uh, around, but he, he listened to more sort of white stations, pop music, people like James Burton on the uh, Ricky Nelson records and uh, guitar solos on the Beach Boys records. He was a great mimic. Um, and in fact, his cover versions were always brilliant. I mean, most 
most uh, music, musicians who become very, very big start off with cover versions and then graduate to their own material. But Jimmy always played cover versions, which were often really brilliant. Yeah, I want to get to the cover versions uh, some more in a bit. It's funny, though, his, his grandmother, she'd swab out his ears with baby oil because he said he heard weird sounds. That's funny. She, she was a, a rather wonderful woman. Um, or she was quite sort of rough with him as well. Um, but he got some, you know, a bit of stability with, with her, like a lot of, you know, kids, you know, with difficult homes, good grandparents step in and his grandmother did. The book is called Wild Thing, The Short Spellbinding Life of Jimi Hendrix by Philip Norman. It's out now. Who were Jimmy's favorite musicians growing up? Well, I mean, he really listened to every. There were quite a lot of local bands who were rather good in that area. And uh, he sort of really started off by, you know, wanting to play with them. Um, and he got into bigger and bigger bands himself. But he was always being fired for sort of not sticking to the formula. The formula was rather disciplined and wearing matching suits. But then a lot of other bands like Hank Ballard and the Midnighters would come through the Seattle area and he'd see them. And he'd manage to get up on stage with them quite often by offering you know, his amp um, if they wanted to use an extra amp. But he'd be already plugged into the amp, so he'd be playing with them. And then later on, uh, he, he went into the army and uh, actually that helped his guitar player. And he, you know, he met sympathetic people in the army with whom he formed a group. And then after that, uh, really, he never went home to Seattle. He joined different uh, touring road shows by different R&B. This was a different artists. This was the, 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 the notorious so-called Chitling Circuit where African-American performers really could only play in their own theaters and clubs and venues. So even enormously famous people like James Brown really sort of stayed on the chicken circuit and that's where he had to be. He would never really have got out of that if he'd stayed in America, um, but he came to London and although London and Britain was racist as well, it was racist in a different sort of way, um, which allowed him to, to flourish in London that he wouldn't have done in the U.S. And his first band was the Velvetones. He moved on to another local band, the Rocking Kings, around this time, which is, I believe, 1959, 1960, he's comfortable enough in front of audiences, and his showmanship starts coming into play. And I know he, Elvis was one another guy he, he was a fan of. Can you talk about how it was a pigeon feather that started it all? This was according to his brother Leon, right? <laughs> yes, yes, and uh, um, he'd, he'd, he, he would dress unconventionally, as she always did. Um, he became a great style icon in, in London in the swinging 60s. But he would steal little sort of decorations of his father's whiskey bottle um, and, yes, a, a, put a feather, you know, in, in his hair and do the, or wear a, a, a young woman's blouse, something like that. And of course, this often got him into trouble because these these bands, they were, they were often called reviews rather than bands because they had sort of horn sections and they were very tight, you know, they knew, synchronized movements and all that. And Jimmy was a bit of an anarchist. And he was, I mean, very, very beautiful young man as well. Very striking in his looks. Um, but had a sort of very... And also his voice. Um, he didn't think he, he could sing himself. Um, and his voice... The, the thing was that because he had this itinerant childhood, they were never in one part of... He and his father and his brother Liam were never in one part of Seattle enough to join a church. Uh, so most African American singers go through that sort of, you know, they learn to sing in church. Jimmy didn't have that, uh, and his voice didn't sat didn't have that kind of R and B kind of rasp, and it was more sort of rather mellow, sort of baritone. So his voice was very, very mellow and deliberate and well enunciated, but his playing was completely wild, and that was a ter terrific combination. October of 1960, Jimmy ends up in the U.S. Army training as a parachutist in its 101st Airborne Division. You write that it would be the most thoroughly fictionalized chapter in Jimmy's life, and a lot came from stories he fed to the media. But there has also been some misinformation out there regarding his discharge. Can you help to separate the fact from fiction as far as his time in the Army? Yes. I mean, he wanted to make a go of being uh, a, what we call a paratrooper um, in the Airborne Division. Um, to, to make his father proud of him. Um, but once he really started playing the guitar, um, particularly with a, a very a kindred spirit called Billy Cox, who played the bass, um, he rather lost interest in soldiering. And he was, he was 
discharged, not, not, not dishonorably, but he really hadn't, you know, hadn't attended much to his duties in the, the closing months and his final, you know, his um, he was oft, often on charges for quite disreputable behaviour as a soldier. And he, he was at stores. In the end, he was like a stores clerk. Wasn't one of the reasons he was discharged because they said he had homosexual tendencies? Oh no, he he, he one of the, his, the ways of getting out was to say that he, he was. I mean, there's no evidence he ever was at all. Um, but uh, that that was one way to be to, to discharge very quickly from any military forces on, in, in the world in those days. It's hard to imagine any musician, the creative type, to have that regimen day to day routine. It, it must have it must have driven him nuts. But he does he does uh, befriend somebody very important to him during this time. He he meets Billy Cox. How did their friendship begin, and and how important is Billy in the story of Jimi Hendrix? He's very important, Billy Cox. Firstly, um, he he heard Jimi practicing in the off, one of the officers' clubs and was very much attracted to to the already you know wildly sort of you know eclectic style of playing and B- billy cox was a, a he wasn't that much older than jimmy he was a little senior to him in the army but uh, uh, he he was became a sort of father figure or a mentor to him um and in fact looking ahead to uh, leaves the jimmy Hendrix experience or it disbands and uh, um, he has a, a new band, band of, called Band of Gypsies, temporarily. Um, Billy Cox he comes back into that. And if Billy Cox had been around in London, um, you know, Jimmy probably wouldn't have died in the awful, wasteful way that he did, because Billy Cox really always looked out for him. After the Army, Jimmy eventually becomes a professional musician. This is around 1962, but it's not easy. You write that he was living hand-to-mouth, often homeless. Yes, but, I mean, but he was... Uh, as, he had some good jobs as well, and he was getting paid. Um, but then he'd often be fired, and then be on his uppers for a while. Um, but playing with a lot of, you know, really, really brilliant people, like Tina Turner, and people like that, a Little Richard, um, learning all the time. What, what in Germany they said the Beatles stole with their eyes. Um, that's what it was. He did have his struggles with being in bands, much like in the Army, where he was, and I was surprised to read this, he'd be fined for various things, like being laid and other various lapses in discipline. That's right, and that was very common when I interviewed James Brown. I remember, uh, you know, James Brown's band at the Apollo Theater in, in New York. They were all fined for having dirty shoes or being laid. It was just, it was quite common. At the same time, of course, he studies and absorbs the stagecraft and the showmanship of all these headliners he worked with, which plays a big role in, in what he became. He also had to deal, as you said, he dealt with racism. Can you talk about some of the struggles he had? There is one story in your book about when his band, the King Casuals, lived in a house and the front door was shot up. Uh, even later, when he arrives in the UK, the publicity always portrayed him as some kind of fairground sideshow, always making mention of him being a quote-unquote Negro in articles. That was something he had to face throughout. Well, yes, um, he lived. You know, he was pretty much in the south, um, in, in the army, and there was a time, yes, when some red, you know, some rednecks saw him when he was walking home. But Jimmy was a great athlete, actually. He was very good at baseball and football, and uh, took off into a cornfield um, and escaped these thugs. Uh, uh, later on, the British racism was different. It was, it was kind of jocular. It wasn't meant sort of often wasn't meant viciously, but it was still racism. Yes, and, and all sorts of nicknames like the wild man from Borneo, things like that. The Black Elvis were, were coined for him, which he kind of didn't mind because he thought they made them sound more interesting. So it was a different sort of racism, but no less insidious. Jimmy's career in life would forever change on a night in May of 1966, I believe it is, when Keith Richards and his girlfriend Linda Keith see him perform at the Cheetah Club at Broadway and West 53rd New York City. Curtis Knight and the Squires are performing, and there's Jimmy. He's the guitarist, but he's going by the name Jimmy James. Can you take us back to that night and, and how that would open the doors to so many important people in the music business for Jimmy? Yes, he was again in this sort of rather, you know, no hope R and B band, but uh, but he had a sort of contract to record as well, and it was L- Linda Keith, who was a girlfriend of Keith Richards, confusingly, uh, of the Rolling Stones, who wandered in with some friends and saw him, and she was the one who really discovered him. She was one of these interesting women who sort of affected the history of rock and rock and roll without ever getting getting any credit, like the the women in, around the Rolling Stones, like Anita Pallenberg and Marianne Faithfull, 
bright, intelligent women who steered the, the musicians in a certain way, but never got any credit. And she eventually re- recommended him to Chas Chandler, who had been the bass player in the, in the Animals, who were the second most popular British group in the so-called British invasion of the US. Chandler just happened to want to go into management, so he brought um, he signed up Jimmy with, without any experience and brought him to London in, yes, in 66, which happened to be right at the apogee of so-called Swinging London, with the club scene and everything amazing, and the Beatles and the Stones and all these people forming a kind of new aristocracy, the Kinks, and the Who, and they all completely went nuts about Jimmy. I mean, they just thought he was fantastic. And there was not a shred of racism about that. They, they simply worshipped him straight away. Eric Clapton in particular. And that leads us to Chapter 7. I love the title. Oh, my God, I'm not God anymore. This alludes to the night Clapton saw Jimmy perform for the first time. That's right. And he didn't actually say that. Someone was sort of rather putting the words into his mouth. But he had been called God, Clapton had, because you know it was the time when guitar superheroes were being created and deified. But uh, at an at a early gig for Cream, which was Clapton's new band, a trio with Ginger Baker and Jack Bruce, Chandler brought Jimmy in and said, oh, can he sit in with you for a couple of numbers? And of course, in which for Jimmy did not mean sitting. Uh, so his full showmanship was unloosed and Clapton simply walked off the stage in bewilderment and was discovered in the dressing room trying to light a cigarette with a shaking hand and said, I didn't know you didn't. Why did you tell me he was that good? Such a great story. And also entering the picture along with Chaz Chandler is Mike Jeffrey. They're co-managers of Jimmy in the early days there. You talked a lot with Trixie Sullivan, who was Jeffrey's secretary. You quote in the book, says he was basically making things up as he went along, Mike Jeffrey. He never had any long-term plans for Jimmy? Well, he was crooked, um, and he saw he, he had managed the animals and mismanaged them. They found they hadn't got any money after years of making hits. But Chandler, although he realized what Jeffrey was like, he had no infrastructure himself as a manager. So on the principle of better the devil you know, he, um, Jeffrey took on Jimmy, but had no idea really what he was worth or what he was like, um, but just saw him as other managers did. They thought this music was only going to last a few more months. Even the Beatles were told that. Make the most of this because it's not going to last. The Stones, everybody was given the same line by their managers. So um, Jeffrey simply worked him into the ground, uh, formed the trio called the Jimmy Hendrix Experience, and they just played all over Britain and all, you know, in the strangest, pokiest little dives, um, just to make, you know, to, to monetize him as, as quickly as possible. The Booked on Rock podcast will return after this. All right, time to check out some of the new and upcoming books on rock releases. Led Zeppelin, the biography by Bob Spitz, was just released through Penguin Press this week. And the author of the definitive New York Times best-selling history of the Beatles comes the authoritative account of the group many call the greatest rock band of all time, arguably the most successful and certainly one of the most notorious. Also released this week, My Life in Dire Straits, the inside story of one of the biggest bands in rock history by John Ilsley of Dire Straits. Released through Diversion Books, this is the first and only inside story of one of the greatest bands in rock history, Dire Straits, as told by founding member and bassist John Ilsley. Rock Concert, an oral history as told by the artists, backstage insiders, and fans who were there by Mark Myers. Released this week through Grove Press, a lively, entertaining, wide-ranging oral history of the golden age of the rock concert based on over 90 interviews with musicians, promoters, stagehands, and others who contributed to the huge cultural phenomenon that is live rock. You can hear my interview with Mark in episode 31 of Booked on Rock. And there's also a great write-up by Mark on the book. You can read on the front page of the review section of Wall Street Journal's November 6th and 7th edition. Check it out. It's a great read. Neil Young on Neil Young, Interviews and Encounters by Arthur Lizzie came out this week through Chicago Review Press the life of rock's most durable troubadour in his own words. Also released this week, Bowie Odyssey 71 by Simon Goddard through Omnibus Press. Simon Goddard continues his groundbreaking immersive narrative of the world around David Bowie through the second year of the decade he changed pop forever. Coming out November 15th through ACC Art Books on hardcover is Nirvana, Nevermind the Photos by photographer Kirk Weddle. 
featuring 150 color and black and white photos, many of them unseen before now. The book showcases the now iconic shot of a baby underwater floating towards a dollar bill on a fish hook, depicted on the cover of Nirvana's 1991 album, Nevermind. Weddell shares the stories of the days shooting that photo, along with a series of images of the band that were not used at the time. Six String Stories by Eric Clapton, due out November 16th through Genesis Publications. Clapton reflects on a legendary career as told to the tools of his trade, his guitars. Collected together here for the first time are the instruments Clapton sold in three record-breaking auctions between 1999 and 2011 to benefit the Crossroads Treatment Center he founded in 1998. Find a link to all the newest and upcoming books on rock releases in this episode's show notes page and on our website, bookedonrock.com. Jimi Hendrix experience, what a band, Noel Redding on bass, Mitch Mitchell on drums, instant chemistry. As we know, Jimmy's unique ability to cover other people's songs, unlike any other artist. And their very first single was a cover of Billy Roberts' song, Hey Joe. His cover of Bob Dylan's All Along the Watchtower was so powerfully transformed that even Dylan himself prefers Jimmy's version over his own. What was it about Jimmy that made him so good at covering other artists' music? It was just they were he reimagined them, you know, that um, Dylan's all along the watchtower. In fact, the original by Dylan wasn't that sort of impressive. Jimmy took it, made it an epic single. There are very few epic singles. Singles were brief, transitory, uh, ephemeral things. There's a few epic singles like Beach Boy's Good Vibrations or um, Dylan's Tangled Up in Blue. But Jimmy made that quite sort of anonymous and rather nonsensical song, pseudo-medieval song, into an epic about it. It was the most extraordinary four-part guitar solo. And Jimmy was at a party, I believe, when he first heard Dylan's version, right? I believe so. And uh, it, was all, it was, you know, very much all around at the time. And Dylan was the god. And he thought, he, and Jimmy thought he was amazing. Jimmy's most iconic live performance is Woodstock, but his appearance at the Monterey Pop Festival, June of 1967, that's a huge moment. This is where he famously sets his guitar on fire. Can you talk about the importance of that performance? His appearance came thanks to Paul McCartney, right? Yes, McCartney was on the board of management. The Beatles were, of course, asked to be on at the Monterey Festival. They couldn't. I mean, they, 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 didn't, they just stopped, recently stopped live concerts. And, uh, but McCartney said he would be on the board of management as Jimmy who had done a wonderful version of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Uh, no one thought they could interfere with that, except Jimmy did. And McCartney said it was the greatest honor of his, his, his career to that date. But he was on with just amazing people, Otis Redding, Janis Joplin, I mean, the absolute cream of the time in rock and pop and soul. And he simply wiped the floor with all of them, with this um, routine of burning the guitar, not only burning it, but kind of making love to it and looked like even urinating on it with his lighter fluid. And uh, he tried it out once in England, hadn't really worked. And rather dangerous it turned out to be. But there, it, it completely knocked people flat. It was extraordinary. And one of the songs you performed that night was Purple Haze, the follow-up single to Hey Joe. You write what inspired this most famous, most exciting, most influential, most mysterious, yet most personal of Jimmy's original compositions has been debated ever since. You explore Jimmy's fascination for science fiction and how that is most likely the genesis of the song. Yes, he read a lot of sci-fi. He read a lot of other things too. And he, um, he, he had a very wide-ranging intelligence without any formal education. So he would listen to uh, Frederick Handel as well as Bob Dylan. Um, but uh, yes, he, it, was, it was a story about a purple gas developing a planet and it just worked on his imagination and uh, and he, he could write. He was quite sort of slow in starting to write his own material and particularly to sing his own material. But once he got going, then he really did. You know, he, uh, he really blasted off. And uh, in, in the end, he even kind of projected himself to be a kind of space traveler himself, rather like putting a girdle around the earth, you know, like Puck in uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. But in a sort of way, he seemed a bit like a sort of extraterrestrial. He didn't seem quite of this world because he was so beautiful and so naturally dignified and so, so and with a great mystery around him. He liked to use water for imagery as well in his music. Yes, I mean, it, it really, um, 
he it was sort of it was truly surreal. I mean, you know, the he used the elements, he used the mood, he used the stars, um, all of that, and uh, that was why Eric clapped. And it was so much in tune with the sort of mysticism that was going on, particularly in you know with the hippies in Britain at the time. And uh, so it was very you know very was another reason why. He fascinated people. Chaz Chandler, you write, was always adamant that while writing and recording Purple Haze, Jimmy never took any acid. Do you believe that? I think so, yes, because Jimmy did what Chandler said. And, uh, you know, Chandler had, had got experience of recording through the animals. And the, the product that they turned out between them was exceptional in a very short time with very limited studio facilities. And I'm sure he did what Chandler told him. And that was true of the Beatles as well, when, when they were making the so-called acid album, which was Revolver. They were, they were not actually taking acid, they were smoking pot, but you know, they, the art came first. Philip Norman's book, Wild Thing, The Short Spellbinding Life of Jimi Hendrix, is out now. The Jimi Hendrix Experience, opening for the Monkees in July of 1967, has gone down as one of the oddest pairings in concert history. Chaz Chandler protested it. He saw how it could negatively affect Jimmy's credibility. That's right, because after Monterey, he sort of, you know, attracted all this attention, but there wasn't a tour set up to follow. So they had to, to take any gigs that they could get and included them, you know, opening for the monkeys, which was very thankless because the monkeys' audience were, you know, 12 year old children, really. But actually, the monkeys, although they were the, like the first sort of confected boy band, um, they actually had real musicians in there, and they were very respectful to Jimmy and, uh, you know, they, they they recognized what what he, what he really was. Jimmy's performance at Woodstock, it was Mike Jeffrey that insisted Jimmy remain the final act of the festival, even though it's going to be at a much later time than expected. It also meant that with all of the artists' caravans taken, Jimmy and the band were led to a small cottage about three muddy fields away. Mitch Mitchell said they spent the rest of the night there freezing. They finally take the stage at 9 a.m. on that Monday morning, the attendance had gone from a half million to about 30,000, as you write. They go on as Jimmy announces Gypsy Sun and the Rainbows. It's nothing but a band of gypsies, he says. We know the rest. The performance rocketed Jimmy to stardom. It became the defining moment of Woodstock and the decade. But my question to you is, what if Jeffrey took up the offer by Woodstock organizer Michael Lang to go on earlier? Would that have made a difference? We know more people would have seen it, it there. Yes, they would. Um, and I think he would still have done that, that a cappella version of Star Spangled Banner, which somehow had the sound effect of the Vietnam War in it. I think whenever he had done that, it would have you know, created a, a milestone uh, in his career, but also in music history of that decade. Yeah, it wouldn't have mattered when he went on. It was iconic. And he simulated those machine gun sounds with a guitar. It, it Still to this day, you get the chills listening to it. Kind of, it's rather like the bit of you know rooftop concert. A few people standing around in the cold watching this great sort of farewell by the Beatles, and it's Jimmy, you know, doing this extraordinary performance. When these hippies are sort of, or they're all muddy and they're all just packing up their bedrolls and leaving. That's you know, that's the audience. Did you ever get the chance to see Jimmy perform live? No, I never did. I never did. Um, I was. On the uh, Sunday Times color magazine, which was very wealthy in those days and could send me all over the world and to interview who I wanted, I was more interested in getting to the States to meet people like Johnny Cash. And he was right under my nose. It's a great regret to me that I didn't actually see him. You write that the demise of the Jimi Hendrix experience happened more slowly with several temporary reprieves along the way. What was it or what were the reasons for the band breaking up? Well, they were exhausted. Uh, they had been worked really into the ground, um, and Jimmy in particular. Jimmy didn't want to go on playing the same old, what he called the same old SH1T, um, and uh, it just really wound down in a sort of anticlimactic way. Uh, that was a shame. You know, the, gym, the experience was very much beside the point. Mitch Mitchell and the two of them were really recruited so that they wouldn't be too good. They wouldn't take attention away from Jimmy. And they were, you know, workmanlike, you know, already. Were, they were good, but they weren't brilliant. They weren't like, you know, the two other people who clapped in, uh, in cream. And but this was, they became stars then. And they all wanted, you know, one of them wanted to do his own album, that sort of thing. What usually affects rock bands uh, after a period of success, they thought they weren't getting enough money. There was a lot of dissension, a lot of negativity around them. 
Chapter 13 of your book, Wild Thing, The Short Spellbinding Life of Jimi Hendrix, is titled, I'm Going to Die Before I'm 30. This story in your book comes from Colette Mimran, who was a girlfriend of Jimmy. Can you tell this story? Yes, um, C- Colette was a, um, someone he met in, in she, she was actually born in Morocco, um, and uh, uh, Jimmy went to Morocco, probably the only vacation he ever had, and it was quite a revelation to him because Colette was a kind of girlfriend, and not a very serious one, who showed him around, really, um, in Morocco, which, of course, is North Africa, which you know he, would, he felt very much an affinity with. But he did go, they saw a clairvoyant where um, uh, she dealt the tarot cards and uh, the death card came up and he, was, he wasn't surprised. He said he knew he was going to die before he was 30. Quite a story. The details concerning what Jimmy was doing, where he was during that last day, September 17th of 1970, they're often disputed. He was officially pronounced dead on the 18th. You try and sort out what is known and what's been said by those who were with him and or saw him during that day. He had been in poor health leading up to then, he, lack of sleep, overworked, right? Yes, um, he'd been on a, a really terrible uh, European tour, uh, which um, he wanted to be in New York because he had his own recording studio by that time. He wanted to record, making records. He had to do a, a, a European tour. It was really hard work with a band that included Billy Cox, his great friend and mentor and protector. They did an awful thing on an island off the German coast, which was supposed to be like another Woodstock. But Hell's, German Hell's Angels wrecked it. And Billy Cox was given some LSD and completely freaked out and had to go back to the US. So his protector with him. And he goes back to London and meets up with a German woman who, uh, who's been an, a sort of uh, ice skate, not much of a, an elevated ice skater, but an ice skating champion of sorts. he met a few months before. And she had booked a little sort of Bed sitting room in a weird hotel in the Notting Hill area. Jimmy, some, she'd hired a car so she could drive Jimmy around London. And uh, it was also a way of sort of getting into herself. And he was actually staying at the Cumberland Hotel at Marble Arch, a large hotel where the telephonist and everybody really fond of him and knew him and liked him. But he, somehow or other, he wound up with German girlfriend in this little bed sit and uh, one needed something to sleep and just took a... a, a a dose of what he thought was a, a small dose of sleeping tablets. Didn't realize that every tablet was a double dose and seemed to be a lunatic way of selling sleeping tablets. And that was what happened. And he was said to have choked on his own vomit, which is what a lot of stars in that era did. Unfortunately, they were surrounded by people supposedly look out, looking after them, but didn't, who didn't look after them. Help was not called in time. There was a strange lapse between the moment when his friend Eric Burden from The Animals was called to this little bedsit, but the ambulance wasn't called until a lot of time later. It looked like people were getting rid of drugs on the premises and trying to save themselves from police investigation. And so he was taken to not a very good local hospital where he was pronounced dead. And it's just a sort of an abiding tragedy. Uh, the, The inquest was very, very inadequate. Most of the people who were witness or involved were not called at the inquest. And so it was just sort of, because it, again, uh, racism uh, kicked in here because he, when he was brought in, no one recognized him. And of course, because he was African-American and because he'd been fetched from the Notting Hill area, which was very much an area for the West Indian population of West London then, he was called, quote, and just another junkie from Notting Hill. So he was, you know, he suffered from racism even in his last moment. And then there were rumors that it might have been suicide. This was based around a poem that he wrote to his girlfriend, Monica Daneman. The story of life is quicker than the wink of an eye. It ended with the story of love is hello and goodbye until we meet again. So there were those that tried to read into that, but there was no indication that that Jimmy... That was a song lyric, really. He was always always writing, scribbling in notebooks and everywhere. There was also a theory because... uh, Mike Jeffrey definitely had ties to the Mafia, but then the Mafia controlled a lot of the music clubs uh, around Greenwich Village at this time. They were moving into rock music, you know, it seemed to make sense from what their previous activities. And so um, it was one theory was that Mike Jeffrey um, wanted him dead because he, he was leaving Jeffrey's management. But actually, he was still involved with Jeffrey's management. 
for, for some time after the end of the contract. So that was ruled out. But then the, the mafia had already taken him over and that he was not being cooperative and that was what they did to people who were not cooperative. I think all of those, all of those theories are plausible, in fact, but the, the accident one is the one that the accident and then the, the neglect of people around him is the true explanation. The Mike Jeffrey story has been explored quite a bit by the media. There is one story, something he said to Monica, that he was afraid that Mike Jeffrey would do something to her or have somebody do something to her. Well, Mon- Monica Dannemann's testimony is very unreliable. Her story of that night changed something like 14 times over time. and You can't really believe anything that she said afterwards. A lot of it was to sort of absolve herself of any sort of responsibility. She she did sort of have him in her power a bit, a bit like a sort of stalker, because he was, you know, very mild and cooperative, couldn't say no, really, and um, so he, he was somewhat in her power. And Mike Jeffrey wouldn't live to face consequences if there were any to face. He died in a plane crash March of 1973. Jimmy released the one album after the breakup of The Experience, the one you mentioned, Band of Gypsies, recorded in New Year's 1970, New York City's Fillmore East. Since his death, there have been several releases, including unreleased tracks he recorded. This may be the biggest what-if question in rock and roll. If not, certainly among the biggest, what would have Jimi Hendrix done musically if he had lived in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and beyond? What do you think? His style of music, his style of guitar playing, was getting very close to bebop, and he had jammed with and, and was a friend of Miles Davis, who was the great music iconoclast of the modern jazz of that time. And uh, Miles Davis, when he saw him on on film, was amazed by him, and I'm sure he, he would have recorded with Miles Davis and with other you know great jazz people because he really was getting to that getting towards that area. And he wanted to. He didn't want to go on doing what he'd done. Although what he'd done is, shouldn't be undervalued. It was really to break down the kind of race barrier, you know, between R and B and rock. Um, and he did both. And he, he bridged that a bit. And he played, you know, for very largely white audiences. But um, you know, that was an extraordinary feat to have done at that time. Do you have a personal favorite Jimi Hendrix song and album? I think it will, it's, it's got to be all along the Watchtower, I think, you know, which is that, that wonderful guitar solo that just you just go on and on. You want it to go on and on. And an album that you would go to most often for Jimmy? I, I think he's a singles man. I think uh, it's it's the, it's the, the single tracks that you cherish. You know, he didn't ever produce a Sergeant Pepper, you know, or or an, or a, an aftermath. I like the Stones. It was it was just fragments of wonderful epic pop. Philip, thank you for being on the podcast, and thank you for writing another great book. Thank you very much indeed for your interest. All the best. Philip Norman's Wild Thing, The Short Spellbinding Life of Jimi Hendrix, is available wherever books are sold. And if you have a local independent bookstore, pick up a copy there and support not just Philip, but your local independent bookstore. A link to find your nearest bookstore on our show notes page and our website, bookedonrock.com. Be sure to subscribe to Booked on Rock at Spreaker or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. You can find us online at bookedonrock.com, on Facebook at facebook.com slash bookedonrockpodcast, on Twitter at bookedonrock. The email address, thebookedonrockpodcast at gmail.com, or you can just go to the website and contact me there. If you're an author of a book on rock and you want to be on the podcast, just send me an email. I'm Eric Senich. Thanks for listening. Join me again next time for another episode of Booked on Rock.